right to vote to former slaves, males. They didn't give it to women, white women. They were disenfranchised, you know what I mean? White males, uh, poor white males, they were disenfranchised, right? So uh, it was necessary to give African Americans a vote because of course they'd be grateful that they had, a, a, you know, that the Republicans had came to their rescue and freed them from bondage, right? And so this gave uh, the Republicans dominance, uh, uh, gave them the opportunity to maintain dominance that they had won on the battlefield. Any event, this is a tedious history, you know, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Once you, and if you get an opportunity after you leave here, please, you know, uh, you know get that book, you know, kind of lays it out and connects all the dots. You know, that's the beauty of it. But with every action, there's a reaction. And uh, after the Reconstruction period, the pushback was uh, Jim Crow, prisons, uh, the chain gangs, anything they can get, do to get that labor back on the plantations. Right? And then there came Plessy versus Ferguson, Ferguson and uh, the old Jim Crow, you know, apartheid in America. Well, the pushback to that came with the, the uh, creation of the NAACP and their struggle all the way up to 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, where uh, legalized uh, 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 segregation of the schools was legally, you know, overturned, you know, turn, overturned, you know, as a result of the court's a court decision. And then after that, uh, you know, uh, the civil rights struggle went on for ten more years. In 1864, they passed the Civil Rights Act, and then in 65, they passed the Voting Rights Act. But when they got to the prison walls, our champions out there, civil rights uh, advocates, Martin Luther King and everyone involved, when they got to the prison wall, they stopped. And they put their back to the wall, and they threw up their hands, and they declared victory, you know, and uh, they had affirmative action in place, and you know, everybody went out to reap the rewards and the benefits of that long struggle that they had put in, you know, where many were killed and, and, and imprisoned and, and uh, reduced to, uh, you know, there was a penalty to pay. But the pushback, for every action there's reaction, the pushback to these advances, passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, there was a pushback to that, and the pushback was the prisons. Suddenly the prison population in the United States, which was predominantly white, even though African Americans were overrepresented since uh, 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 1914, you know, I think it was something like 28% then. Suddenly the prison population goes from 300,000 to 2.3.4 million today, right? And so everything that we had gained as a result of the Voting Rights Act was taken away right behind the prison wall because everybody in prison, with the, except, with the exception of two states, uh, have lost their right to vote. The only two states that people, prisoners vote from their cells is Maine and Vermont, right? So what we have today is this population in prison that's disenfranchised. Then we also have, as was mentioned earlier, another five million that out there on probation, parole, and uh, control of the criminal justice system that for the most part are disenfranchised also. And since this population is for the most part African American and Latino, this impacts directly the communities that these prisoners come from, right? And so what we find is that the, the, the objective of, uh, of, of this, this, this uh, this system has been, from its very inception, was to keep African Americans away from the ballot box, powerless. And in fact, and the Republicans abandoned them in something like 1876 when they had a thing called the Southern Compromise. They had one of them tight elections like Bush Gore and, and uh, the, the Republicans, the Democrats, the Southern Democrats, agreed to let the Republicans have the, the presidential office in return. They, they would pull all the troops out of the South. And once they pulled the troops out of the South, that was it for African Americans. <laughs> I mean, they were represented on every level of government, 
government, but by uh, uh, 1903, 1906, I think there might have been two black political representatives left in the United States of America. I mean, they completely wiped them out. Oh. So we had this sec second civil war, which is uh, which a civil rights struggle. Then we had the second reconstruction period when uh, African Americans got the right to vote back as a result of the Voting Rights Act. Suddenly we went from 700 uh, political representatives to something like 7,000. Right? So how do they push back? They push back with the prison industrial complex. Right? All across America, wherever you go, in every state where there are African Americans, whether they are 2% of the population, 12% of the population, 50% of the population, 40% of the population, they are disproportionately represented in that prison industrial complex, that prison industrial population, right? So what we have here is African Americans represent something like 12.4% of the entire population of the United States, yet we represent along with Latinos, we represent over 60% of the total prison population of the United States. And here in New York, we represent 90% of the prison population here in New York, right? So this thing has been turned completely upside down. Just the facts, those facts alone makes it uh, uh, beyond argument that this system operates in a, a racially disparate way, right? It's another system, man, stop frisk, just like stop frisk. 700 of stop frisk, man, 80, 90% of those stop and frisk by African American and Latin. You know? You know what the police says to me? You know, because I just recently locked up for the same thing myself. You know, ended up spending three days in the 32nd precinct you know, on 35th Street. They say to me, man, uh, you know, don't be playing that race card, man. You know, we not racist. You know, look where we work. You know. Oh, you work here in Harlem, and that, that explains, uh, you know, why, you know, we having this disparate thing. You come from Long Island, uh, a, a, a predominantly white community, and you come here. Would you police like that in your community? Huh? Would you treat your brothers and sisters and friends and mothers and aunts and uncles? If they were subjected to the same thing, would that be all right? You know? But basically, the, the educational level of those that are wearing those uniforms uh, is, you know, is a little better than, you know, GED, you know. Here's a person going to sell out 20 years of his life meddling in other people's lives, you know, walking around with a, a, a bullseye on his chest. You know, I had the, the, the opportunity to ask one of the police officers in 30 seconds. He said, man, what did you want to be when you was young? He said, well, an astronaut. Now look at the difference between being an astronaut and, and, and working in the 32nd precinct in Harlem. <laughs> You know, I said, man, I mean, you got to feel like a piece of shit, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, but the point is, is that this prison industrial complex is just part of a larger picture. And it's part of a larger problem, you know. American economy is busted. There's no jobs in this role. It had a good run for 100 years, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's in a state of decline now. It can't compete with China, 1.3 billion people. It can't compete with India. I mean, it, it's just, you know, China can put 100 million people into uh, uh, technology, 100 pe million people into, into just cooking school. You know? So you can't compete with them. And America has opted to be the policeman of the world. And uh, they cannot go out and project their foreign policy out into the world unless they have control of this population right here in America.